Okay, next we have, uh, we have Steve Serwin, Whiskey Alpha 5, Foxtrot Radio, Foxtrot, WA5, FRF. Uh, he's from the Hamside community. He's going to be talking about WWV time tick arrival time study to investigate multiple modes during daily dawn and dusk transitions. So I know some people were asking earlier for a better explanation of what we meant by Doppler shift. I think Steve's presentation will be able to answer that and show some of the nice results that we're getting from this. So uh, whenever you're ready, Steve, take it away. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, or still morning here. I'm Steve Serwin. I'm gonna to talk to you about some um, experiments I did in looking at the timing. Um, of WWV pulses to attempt to uh, shed more light on some of the Doppler shifts that you see. So let's see, we'll do that. I want to make sure that I did the uh, audio transfer and then go to full screen. Okay, the data I'm going to give to you is taken on a path that was from Fort Collins, Colorado to my location in, uh, well, it's near San Antonio. It's about 30 miles west of the city. Okay, the motivation, the reason I wanted to do this is when I was doing the ARRL frequency measurement uh, tests, I noticed that, especially at dawn, the, the Doppler shifts kind of go crazy. During the evening, there was, Lots of frequency variants. It's at five megahertz during the day. It's fairly quiet, but boy, when dawn comes, the tracks just run amok. And this amok time corresponds to the opening of higher angle modes. In particular, this is a graph of critical frequency, which is a very good metric to find out uh, if higher angle modes can propagate or not. So my thoughts at the time were perhaps <clears throat> these multiple modes, which sure look like they appear in some sort of geometric progression or overtone order, might be multiple modes, in particular multiple hops coming from the ionosphere. There is a number of other hints that suggest this. One is, for example, uh, this mode doesn't manifest until you're halfway through that dawn transition, because that's how long it took for that angle corresponding to that mode to become viable. This is two and a half megahertz. They exhibit the same thing. Uh, five megahertz is the one we're talking about in particular. Here's, here's a straight line mode, one overtone, another, and yet another. None of that goes on at 10 megahertz, but the critical frequency never got that high. So Doppler always infers a change in path length with time. Doppler is, in fact, the ratio of uh, velocity to the speed of light times the center frequency. So for 5 megahertz, it's velocity divided by 60. We'll, we'll give you what the Doppler is if you know the, the speed in meters per second. So here's the setup. Here's a fixed station, fixed receiver. That doesn't change. What does change is the path that the radio wave takes to get from transmit to receive. And that is changed by the height of the ionization layer. If the ionization layer is fixed, there's no change in relative path, there's no Doppler. Multiple hop modes have a longer path as opposed to a single hop mode. So as this ionization descends, those longer paths get, have to get shorter faster. They have more velocity, so they have more Doppler shifts. That was the, uh, the thing I was trying to look at. And of course, as the sun comes up, propagation at higher and higher angles become possible. So how do you know if what you're hearing is coming on what kind of mode? We looked at measurement of the angle of arrival. That's possible, but hard. Certainly not within most hams reach. But timing. Timing is something a lot easier to measure. This path, this double hop path is longer than this one, so the time of flight is longer. Now, other things happen at dawn that complicate things. Pedersen waves appear, which are these modes that are high angle, but spend a lot of time up in the ionization region. The D and E layers wake up at dawn. F layer splits. Um, <coughs> wave speeds are accelerating and decelerating, and an accelerating wave speed does the same thing to frequency that a closing uh, path does. 
wave, wave uh, fronts punch up and you get a frequency increase. Not only that, but sometimes, very often in fact, um, at five megahertz here in South Texas, I can hear both WWV in, in Fort Collins and WWVH in Hawaii. They're both there, they have their own uh, Doppler shift schedules and so separating these things can, can be a problem. Timing can help sort this out. So here's published data on WWV over here on the left. These timing ticks are five cycles of one kilohertz for WWV. WWVH from Hawaii sends six cycles of 1200 hertz. In addition, they, they send these tones uh, with quiet periods in between. And these 500 and 600 hertz tones swap. One minute it's WWV on 500, the next minute it's WWVH on 500, so they interchange. Synchronization for time can be obtained from the one pulse per second output from a GPS DO. So here is some actual on the air pulses. Here's a, one of those times when both WWV come in and WWVH. Uh, they're separated in time by like 17 milliseconds because Hawaii is so much farther away. Here was below this, this green trace is a particular time when I heard WWVH, but not WWV. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard the, these time ticks, I'm gonna play a little audio. You'll hear this tone on the left uh, coming and going. Then you'll hear voice announcements, female voice for Hawaii, male voice for um, Fort Collins. You'll hear both of them. And then you'll hear the tones start again. And all through this, you'll hear these annoyingly loud time ticks. At the tone, 12 hours, 2 minutes, coordinated universal time. And so that's WWV, and those ticks are what we're talking about. So uh, how do you measure those? It's, it's not real hard. You could get by with just a, a good receiver and uh, a digital scope I use because it makes good records and enables on-screen measurements. This was a... Uh, Agilent scope. To synchronize it, this little purple trace right here is a sync pulse. It's the one pulse per second output from the GPS DO. I also look at the spectra. For example, here's a one morning's spectra of the amok time of WWV during the uh, dawn transition. And I use an R8600, which has been stabilized with the 10 megahertz reference output. So I wanted to find out what kind of time delays to expect. So I put together this simplistic idealized geometry, flat earth, uh, constant reflection height. Here's the path distance, here's the reflection height. So now simple geometry can let you calculate this path for one hop, two hops, three hops. And then uh, you can convert path length to time of flight through the speed of light. And so here is a graph of these equations corrected to uh, speed of light for reflection heights from like 100 to 400 kilometers. So here is the primary one hop mode. Here's the time of flight for two hops. And here's the time of flight for three hops. Now, the thing to notice is, let's pick a mid range here. The time difference between one hop and two is a millisecond or so. For the next mode, it may be two milliseconds point is that the pulse length is five milliseconds. So these delayed copies come down on top of the primary. They superimpose. So you're looking at superposition. So here's two lines of data. This, this one is simulated on a SPICE program, just summing two five cycle uh, sine waves together. And down here is measured instances of what we're seeing. In this first graph is one millisecond of time difference turns this five cycle pulse into a six cycle pulse. <clears throat> so this pulse out here in front is this one by itself. These are the sum of the ones in the middle. The one on the end is the, sec the delayed pulse all by itself. Can you see those on the air? Yep, here it is. That same picture with the first and last pulses smaller, six pulses from WWV instead of five. 
if the if you have two milliseconds of delay you have two cycles at the beginning and from the first pulse and two cycles from the end from the last to make a seven cycle pulse here is one of those and similarly for three milliseconds delay you get an eight cycle long pulse and here is one of those so you got to calibrate the receiver um, that ic7610 that i used is a a software defined radio and software defined radios have a relatively long processing time to get from the input to the output and you have to know what that is so i cobbled together this little am burst waveform for, with lab signal generators, fed it, fed it to the input of the 7610, and here is what came out, the audio. Two things, it's delayed by four milliseconds. Secondly, the 7610 has an inverting path. In other words, when the amplitude gets bigger, the output goes negative. I took all my measurements to the middle of this first positive cycle. Uh, here's my, my sync reference from the GPSDO. Here's where I measured to. This is where I want to measure to. So I, I measure from here to here. I've got to subtract out the four milliseconds delayed through the 7610, and I've got to subtract out this three quarters of a wave. So it's that measurement minus 4.75 gives me arrival time with the primary pulse. So I measured a bunch of these things. You know, sit in front of your radio for five hours. Uh, capturing screen captures, and then spend another two days uh, inputting it to a spreadsheet, make a cluster plot, and they clustered. They clustered in layers, which suspiciously look like multiple hops to me. Here's the timing data for the, for the one hop data from 1200 Zulu to 1530, and here's the delayed copies. So this first, first hop was done by referencing to the beginning of the pulse, and then these were delays. How much did the pulse extend in length, which is the, the delayed arrival of the multiple hops. For reference here, sunrise at my QTH, here sunrise at uh, WWV. When the sunrise was over the mean path, I started picking up these higher angle modes. I took that graph I showed you earlier about predicted times of flight, turned it around so that I have a descending reflection layer here. And then I cropped it, cropped it, picked the part of that graph that matched the data that I measured. Now, this data was not continuous because I took these sequentially and out of the 14,000 one second pulses I got, I only collected about 250. So there's big gaps in here. I interpolated linear interpolations so that I could get a continuous function that Excel could draw a trend line through. And that uh, they lined up pretty good. I got some good reference data from both Nathaniel and um, Carl. Nathaniel sent me this far lap, um, far lap ray trace predictions at a specific time on that day. Here's 1200 Zulu. I happen to have a data point at 1201. Um, here is his prediction of the time of flight, and this blue bubble here is my measurement. So I didn't think that was too far off. It's within uh, tens of microseconds, maybe maybe 50 or so. Here's the same data for two hops, far left data for two hops. Now you can get both both uh, pieces of data from this pulse because timing to the beginning of it is just the one hop mode. And then looking at the pulse extension at the end is the delayed copy. So you get the second hop uh, delay here. So here was the timing to the uh, first reception, and then here's the delayed copy. And those fit nicely to the points where uh, his graph diverges into the two modes. Thank you, Nathaniel W2NAF, for that data. Carl, um, K9LA, sent me Prop Lab Pro simulations. Uh, for a three hop mode. Here's a, a three hop data trace. You can see the extra two cycles here on the end. Uh, his, the PropLab Pro predicted 6.46 milliseconds. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, he, he uh, estimated 6.46 with the uh, ray trace simulation. The measurement was 6.38. A little bit about making these measurements. Um, 
I did these by looking at the extension on the end. But there's a better way. And the reason there's a better way is that all these pulses in the middle are distorted by superposition. That's the time when both pulses are present. This first pulse is all by itself. It's the one hop mode. These last pulses, these last cycles, I should say, are from the delayed copy only. So they are not distorted by superposition. So the best way to measure this is to uh, reference off the leading edge and the trailing edge. So you do the same kind of subtractions, but in addition, pull off these four interim cycles. That's a better way of measuring it. Five minutes. Okay, and we're just about done, that's good. Here is the uh, reality of the morning dawn transition. This is prop lab simulations from two and a half hours before sunrise to two and a half hours after sunrise. So you can see that while it's still pitch dark, pretty much one hot propagation is all there is. And by the way, this is a function of angle. And you can see that a lot of these angles don't get refracted. About the time sunrise makes it to my QTH, now we're starting getting these two hop modes, sort of jives with that uh, one mode manifesting at just the right time. Mean sunrise between the path, it, it gets sunrise here a little before it does in uh, Fort Collins, which is farther west. Here's uh, three hops starting to happen. And then as the sun continues to uh, come up, more modes happen. You can see some Pedersen rays coming in here. Um, you can see the overall lowering of the ionization region. If you could plot all of that uh, and then take the time rate of change, you could infer Doppler from that. You can also see that there's refraction from multiple heights in here. So the point is that it's a complicated, as, as a common vernacular, it's complicated. And um, the timing analysis can help sort this out. Okay, we can take questions. Thank you so much, Steve. Very nice analysis. Uh, questions. See, moderators, do you have any questions? Yeah, I had one. Uh, this is Gareth Perry. Um, Steve, I might have missed it, but uh, how do you know you're not seeing just a uh, mode decoupling? So you're not seeing a decoupling of the O and the X mode as that delayed pulse or that delayed, uh, um, you, you talked about uh, the arrival of a pulse and then, you know, a bit of a delay with a copy. Um, did you discuss um, mode separation between O and X mode there? How much, how much time difference is there between those two? Oh, I wouldn't know. Uh, off the top of my head, microseconds perhaps? Well, the, Somebody else want to shout at me for that answer? I, if if it's ahead. microseconds, then that's not going on because the time differences that we're seeing are milliseconds, which really do jive with the geometry. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. you uh, certainly doing that O and X mode timing prediction, uh, that's something that Barlap could give us. It could tell us uh, what the expected differences would be. So then we could basically rule that out. Or at least know how to account for it. That's right, yes. It's a complicated process and I certainly don't know all what goes on here. This is a work in progress. But it looks like that, that the, this data does point to, anyway, suggest that those multiple frequency tracks, uh, divergence of the Doppler into three or four different modes uh, is from different modes. Whether one's three hops or four hops versus a uh, Pedersen wave, I don't know. Got to figure out some more ways to separate those things. One more question. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much, Steve. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Nathaniel. We'll keep working on this.